Today we're at Strawberry Fields in Central Park with Mark Hudson. He's a world-famous entertainer, a Grammy Award-winning songwriter, and a prolific music producer with a wealth of knowledge and an endless supply of rock and roll anecdotes. We asked Mark to discuss the plight of the modern rock musician and what he might do if he was trying to start a career anew in today's music world. Mark, you're 25 years old uh, in rock and roll these days. How do you create, and you're unknown, how do you create a rock and roll career? Um, the first thing that I think that you have to do, it's all about the song, always has been. From Dylan to the Beatles to you name it, to Carol King, it's the song first. When I was 25 years old, the first thing that I would do is concentrate on the songwriting process. Because once you have a good song, it's tough to screw it up. The media now is so quick, and people get so bored so quickly, that you don't get to sit back and listen to Zeppelin IV or Abbey Road. It's kind of like, oh, I love that Maroon 5 song. Oh, I love that Iggy song. Oh, I love that Katy Perry song. And it's all like singles botched together. I think if I were 25, I would try to find the concept again and do something that so that when somebody hears my band, they go, oh, it's those guys. If you're an up-and-coming rocker that has a body of work that you're proud of, that's that 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 I'm, I I want to have a rock and roll career. How do you go about having that career? Well, it, it's actually more it's actually more difficult than it's ever been uh, because before you would you would get a, a label interested, they would sign you, they would have an A and R department that would turn you on to stuff, and they would help it along. Those days are gone. So what you really have to do is be great live. Yeah. You've got to be able to say, I'm playing CBGBs, I'm, I'm, I'm down at the bitter end, or I'm wherever, at, at dingbats. And you just have to be able to kick such ass that someone's going to go, I don't know what those guys are, but I, I, I want to see more of it. And then, then, once again, remember, if that's backed with good songwriting, who doesn't want to see more of that? You talked about Abbey Road. And, and, yeah. Uh, and, Various Zeppelin albums. I mean, with the difficulties you just described, mm. I, can you make an album like that these days? Well, you can, but you know, you also have to look at, you know, the Beatles are the prime example of taking us as an audience from the pop generation and slowly moving us into Rubber Soul, which mm -hmm. became more right. acoustic right. and sitars, and then Revolver. Turn off your mind and relax and float downstream. Whoa. <laughs> It became that. Is there a budget for something yeah. like that no, these no, days? I mean, the other part is. Yeah, yeah. You know, I make my money on residuals. If I write, living on the edge of Aerosmith, mm -hmm. I made a ton of money. Something for Celine. But now, because of the internet, all of that has gone away. Right. One kid will download it, share it with 70,000 people, and I get paid 99 cents. That's why I'm living in the park now. All right. Once I kick you out, I'm sleeping. I thought I saw you over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If we were a band long enough to build an audience, like right. the Beatles did, and even Dark Side of the Moon, even Pink Floyd. If you can build an audience, they'll go with you anywhere. And I and I just think we haven't had bands around long enough to right. have that happen. Making money by selling records is not going to happen anymore. Now, mm -hmm. Katy Perry, different story, because that's broad, right. universal, worldwide. And not to brag, but my daughter Sarah co-wrote the song Dark Horse with Katy Perry. Vote for the Grammy. <laughs> you know, weird, but as a I was going to ask you if you wanted a plug oh, in there someplace. Uh, the budget, the like, recording studios are dying left and right. Mm -hmm. right. Because they end up going, all right, Mark, let's make an album with this band. Here's $27,000, and if you can, uh, whatever you make over the top of that, you can keep. Well, what they don't realize is $27,000 was our food budget right. for Aerosmith. And they're saying, now make an entire album, mixed, ready, done, musicians, any additional musicians like strings or horns so you're screwed that's why records are being made in their closets and in the basement i heard that david bowie's album sold 65,000 copies in the old days he would have done that in the first week and doubled or tripled but now because of downloading and because of you know, piracy and thieves or whatever you want to call it or maybe that's just what it is and that's why prince and you too they give the record away for nothing because they're not going to really make any money doing that. Uh -huh. They'll make money when they play live and they sell out a concert and then the merchandising of the t-shirt. Mark, is there such a thing as artist development anymore? You know what, I, I, I only wish that there was because I think that the, the John Kolodners of the world and all these guys that used to take a band 
and I would sit with you as my band member, and I would beat you up until you gave me, and I would say, you're not ready. That mm -hmm. sucks. Change the bridge. And, mm -hmm. and those guys were so well-versed that the bands would listen to them. And next thing you know, I mean, I can remember even when I was in the Hudson Brothers and stuff, they would say, first album, maybe we'll sell 30,000. But we're going to set you up for the third album. Wow. Now, you get one single, right. and you're frisbeed, and you're working right. at Starbucks by the right. time the, the record's over with. Nurturing a band and making sure they were great, those days are gone, and we really, really miss it. And all the young kids don't know the difference, because they don't have it. What you really want to do is make art for art's sake. When you do that, how can you not help but grow and get better? I, I was the band leader for Joan Rivers and, and when she did her talk show. And we became very good friends, and she was a mentor to me and all this. And on the opening show at Fox, she called me in the dressing room and she goes, listen, and she had that voice and she was very powerful. Listen, I want you to go out there tonight and I want you to cross every line you can as long as you believe in it. She goes, and if they don't believe in you, fuck them, draw your own line. <laughs> there it is, draw, make your own line. What do you think the Beatles were? What do you think any of these bands that made the difference? They're all guys that weren't afraid to cross the line. We gotta get back to that, because we're so far away from it. All the computers and all of this, all the teams that are making records. You know what, most people that are making records now have never loaded a van, they never played a club, they've never been beaten up by someone's boyfriend you were flirting with. All of those things that happened in bands doesn't exist anymore. It's a kid with a computer who doesn't play an instrument. And I think we gotta get back to some sort of rudimentary thing about we're a band. To help give us the artist's perspective, Mark invited Sean Michael Murray, lead singer for Fancy Reagan. They're a band that was recently signed to Republic Records. How did you get the record deal? That's what I want to know. Oh, okay. Yeah, because yeah, it's no, a standard way of sure, sure, sure. getting a deal or not. Yeah, no, it's not. Uh, well, we came through a, a reality show through VH1 and Republic Records that they kind of joined forces and made called uh, Make a Band Famous. And it started out with submitting uh, an Instagram video, a 15 second Instagram video. And after that, there's about 3,500 bands that submitted across the nation. And then they narrowed it down to 60 bands, which then turned into a social media voting kind of between Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, where, you know, your fan bases had to tweet or, you know, Facebook or whatever votes for you. Um, and then the top 60 turned into a top 24, which then um, turned into a live show, a, a live stream and a live show. And uh, we went out to... Um, what was it called, uh, the Liberty Warehouse out in Brooklyn, and we all competed over a 24-hour period at different intense challenges that were, you know, one of the challenges was writing a song in three hours, one of the mm -hmm. challenges was taking a, a cover song and using kids' toys to make an arrangement of it and perform it the best you possibly could, and you had an hour to learn the song if you didn't know the song and perform it, so there was just a bunch of different challenges, and uh, we kept making it further and further, and we got all the way to the end in the final three, performed live in front of the judges and in front of all the uh, executives at uh, Republic Records, Charlie Walk, um, and uh, the head of A&R over there, Rob Stevenson, and uh, we came out on top. And uh, for the past seven weeks, we've been in the studio writing and recording um, demos and, and trying to find our hit song. <laughs> Sean, what are your expectations going forward? What do you, what do you hope to achieve, in, say, in the next year? Yeah, as far as the, um, the band goes, um, I think the biggest thing is you know, coming up with the material and the songs that really adhere to a younger generation. Come up with the songs? Where did you hear that? <laughs> okay, sorry. Come up with the, uh, the songs and the material that really adhere to uh, what we as a band want to say and uh, what we feel, you know, ultimately will speak to our generation and younger generations and even the older generations because um, we want to be um, approachable for any demographic. We don't want to limit ourselves to, say, you know, a younger demographic or mid-tier demographic. We want to be you know, spread a message, spread a message across the world that everyone can understand and uh, and relate to. For the the, the sure. contest, what was your strategy in terms of becoming? Uh, you know, how old are you? I'm 24. So you're 24, near 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 25 years old. But the question is, what was your strategy? What were your guys thinking? Like, what were, what are we going to do to create a rock career for ourselves for our band? I mean, first of all, um, my approach has always been stay true to yourself, which in this day and age can sometimes be hard, especially with you know a lot of the, the industry and and wanting to mold you a certain way you guys just gotta stick stick to your guns and know who you are and trust that what you do is enough 
Um, and I think that was the biggest thing for us is to stay true to ourselves and don't worry about what everybody else does. Worry about what we do and who we're going to be. And so we all know our strengths and weaknesses and playing up to all of our strengths, I think, was really what is setting us apart and what will set us apart going forward in the future. As far as the music right. business goes, we all are in the music business in a sense and understand it to a certain capacity. Moving forward, now that we've achieved this next level, and even going forward, is we want to remove hats. We don't want to play manager. We don't want to play booking our own shows, which we don't have to anymore. You know, that's when you know someone like Mark can help us out and say, "Hey, look, I've got some friends that are managers that you know, you guys check really this guy check out. this guy out." And you know, marriage. in order to get to the next level, you really can't wear some of your hats. You got to worry just about the music and the songwriting and, and performing. You can't worry about you know. The, the business aspect of it. And we don't See, want it. And, and to me, not to interrupt, but the reason why I think that's so healthy with a band like Fancy Reagan is they're more concerned, like I said early on, about the song and the art. And as soon as they start worrying about the merchandising and the lawyer and the points and the manager and the this, all of a sudden the music gets a little squashed. Mm -hmm. They have to be able to be free to express the music and all that other stuff, which I usually call crap, Fluff, yeah. happens afterwards. The other thing is this too, remember he was in a competition. Right. And there was other bands doing what they thought were, were right. Mm -hmm. And th there's no guarantee that even he's going to be right. Sure. We, we never really know, but all you can do is the best that you can do. And you never know if anything works until afterwards. So write the great song, they're great live. You see them live, that's already done. And usually it doesn't work that way. Usually you make the record, and then all of a sudden, oh God, now we need four months of rehearsal. Right. Because the band has got to get good. Mm -hmm. They're kind of the other way around. Mm -hmm. They've been writing songs already. The band is great live already. So all you can do now is hope and pray that the gods of music are going to go, that's, that's a hit. That's a hit. Determination, um, wanting this over everything else, and knowing that you have something to say, and you want to share that with people, at the end of the day, isn't that what it's all about? For more information on the band, check out their site at FancyReagan.com.